Hello, I'm Cal Wellborn. Acarologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. We're going to be keying out uh, a spider mite to the genus Tetranicus. Okay, starting with a slide mounted mite, uh, we have an adult. We have one, two, three, four pairs of legs. You have your prodorsal area here with We'll go to higher magnification in a minute, but we have a prodorsal area here, your epistosoma here. These are the main areas for looking at, your nathosoma, the palps. So we're going to go to higher magnification now and start with the key. Right. Here's your prodorsum and three pairs of CD, one pair behind here, two, three. This is your eyes. This is your dorsal sejugal furrow. And from here back is your epistosoma. Starting with the key, couplet one, idiosoma with one to four pairs of lateral stigmata, posterior to leg two, coxy free and movable, without prodorsal trichobothria or podocephalic canals, adults with four pairs of legs. Well, as we saw in the earlier one, we have four pairs of legs. We're going to go to a higher magnification so we can see the characters. Characters, idiosoma with one to four pairs of lateral stigmata, posterior to leg two coxy free and movable without podorsal trichobothria or podocephalic canals, adults with four pairs of legs, versus without stigmata, posterior leg two, stigmata absent, located on the clisteral bases or on anterior of the prodorsum, coxa fused to ventral body, uh, podorsal trichobothria present or absent, a pair of podocephalic canals frequently visible on the anterior uh, prodorsum with two to four legs in adults. We've already determined it's got four pairs of legs, so now what we need to do is look at the uh, respiratory system. This is, this is leg one, leg two, and we will be looking for stigmata posterior to leg two, and if we focus here, uh, there's, there's nothing to be seen. Check the other side. There's leg one, there's leg two, so we're looking for stigmata in this area, and there's nothing, nothing there. We focus dorsal ventral, there's nothing there. So we go back, and let's look at the prodorsum, see if we can see any stigmata here. If we focus, Here's your, um, this is the style of four. This is where your clissary are. If you look right here, you see this curved structure that goes around to here. And there's a matching curved structure that goes around to here. These are your paratremes. You follow them together and there's your stigmata. So it does not have lateral stigmata. It has uh, stigmata present in the base of the clissary. Uh, other characters, um, coxal fields, coxy fused. Uh, if we focus, let's focus on, on leg three and four. They're a little easier to see the coxy on these. Now, ideally, you can't really tell. This is coxa three, and this is coxa four. This is the first segment here is just narrow segment your trochanter. Now, looking at this, you can't say whether it's movable or not. But I'll tell you, they are immovable. So the other characters are um, podocephalic canal or anterior trichobothria. Moving back to the anterior of the mite, there are three pairs of CD on the anterior of this particular mite. We have one pair, the other seed is here. We have another pair here. Or the eyes, we have another pair, one's here. And if I move it a little bit, you can see the other one. These are your three pairs of prodorsal CD. If they were trichobothria, there would be a pit at the base. Uh, there are no pits, so there are no trichobothria here. These are just normal CD. And the other character is podocephalic canal. Postcephalic canal is not always visible. On this specimen, I do.
to not see it, but based on the characters we've seen, there are no um, lateral stigmata posterior leg two. Coxie, you really can't tell whether it's free or not. There's no trichobothria, and potosylvat canal we can't see. But we do have stigmata at the base of the clissary with paratremes on the anterior of the prodorsum. Coxier fuse, again, all you can't see it. Uh, trichobothria can be present or absent. In this case, they're absent. Uh, we don't see the potocephalic canal in this particular specimen. It's a care form as we move to couplet two. Those characters are clissary, rarely chelate, usually with reduced fixed digit and modified movable digit. Palps linear or with claw-like CD on palp tibia, thumb claw, rutella absent, stigmata opening between the clisteral bases or on the anterior of the prodorsum or absent. Paratremes on the dorsal of the clisteral bases or on the prodorsum or absent versus clisteral chelate, palps linear, rutella usually present, stigmata and paratremes absent. We've already determined that there's uh, stigmata and paratremes. Here's your paratreme, comes around to here, and there's, they're always paired, so there'll always be a matching one on the other side. If you follow them back to the base, the stigmata is, is down in here. So the paratremes come up and loop around. They come up and loop around on the anterior part of the prodorsum. The clissary, in this case, it's a little hard to see the clissary or to recognize, I should say, to recognize the clissary because they're so highly modified. Here is one clissary movable digit and here is the other movable digit. Here is a stylophore. It's actually the fused bases of the clissary. And in this case, it's, it's retractable. It's what we call a stylophore. The clissary, in this case, all that's left of the clissary digits is this long movable digit, paired movable digits, and they are hooked basally. This is a characteristic of the tetranicoidea, not just the tetranicoidea. All members of the tetranicoidea have this characteristic hooked movable digit. The other character to separate the prostigmata from the uh, sarcoptiformes is the presence of a palp tibial claw-like ceda. Uh, here we have the palp. Here's your femur, your palp genu, palp tibia, and right there is your palp tarsus. Now right, sort of hiding the palp tarsus, this is the palp tibia here, there's your palp tarsus. There is this claw-like ceda. Not all the tetranicoidea have this claw-like ceda, but it's present in the tetranicoidea. It's sometimes called the palptibial claw. It's actually a modified ceda. In this view, you can see the claw-like ceda right there. Here's your palp tarsus behind it. And then this is the rest of the palp tibia. So in this case, it has a modified clissera with long and style like movable digit. It has a palp tibial claw or thumb claw as we call it. Rutella would be structures that would be around the mouth parts and they'd be heavily sclerotized, rounded structures right in this area. They are not present. Stigmata opening between the cholesterol bases as we looked, saw in the other just, just a minute ago. All right, here's your, your Here's your stylophore, and your stigmatal opening is right here where, the, where the, the paratremes come together, right there. So it has the anterior uh, stigmatal opening, so we determine it's prostigmata. We move into the prostigmata, a couplet uh, three. Adults and immatures with four pairs of legs versus adults and immatures with two pairs of legs. So we already saw that there are four pairs of legs here. So we can move on, we can exclude the area theoidea. Move on to couplet four. Uh, pretarsal and podium claw-like, split distally, pad-like, 
or rayed with tinted hairs or absent. All instars with stigmatal openings at the base of the nathosoma on the nathosoma or absent. This is verse pretarsus and podium. Two and three, membranous, nude, only females with anterior lateral stigmatal openings. Well, very determined, the stigmatal opening is, is anterior, right here, right in here. Your paratrium's coming up and looping around. So we always determine we have anterior uh, stigmatal openings that are at the base of the clissary. All right, we're looking, we're now looking at leg four, pretarsus leg four, and we have paraclaws and impodium. Okay, we're on couplet four, pretarsal impodium, legs two and three, uh, claw-like, split distally, pad-like, or rayed with tenant hairs, or absent. All active instars with stigmatal openings at the base of the nathosoma, or on the prodorsal, on the nathosoma, or, or absent. Versus uh, impodium with legs two and three, membranous, nude, only females with anterior lateral stigmatal openings. We've already determined, looking at, at the specimen before, that it has stigmatal openings between the clitoral bases. Now we're looking at the pretarsus. We've gone to oil, oil immersion, which is frequently necessary for looking at the pretarsus. And although, although the couplet says one and two, that's the most important ones, but in most cases, they're the same regardless of which uh, leg you go to. We're on, on three here. And in this specimen, we can see, let me move it up a little bit. We can see a structure here that comes out into multiple hairs, multiple structures. This is the impodium, and there, there are no uh, tenant hairs on it. And then right beside it, you can see a structure, rounded structure right here. This is the one claw, and there's another claw on the other side. These long structures coming out of that claw, these long structures coming out of the claw that end in, in a expanded tip here, these are the tent hairs. You can see there's two coming off, at least two coming off each claw, one on this side, and then there's one on the other side of the, of the impodium. Ten hairs are defined by the fact that they end in a knot or a, some sort of a tip, like here. If it doesn't end in a tip or just long and, and straight like these are, these are called just, just setules or hairs. Uh, they're not tenant hairs. They're actually part of the impodium here. So it's not a heterostigmata. We'll move on to the, the couplet five. We're now we're looking at the trichobothria. And we're on oil. We'll just stay on oil. Here is one of your anterior most pair of CD, a prodorsal CD. Here's your anterior most prodorsal CD. These are normal CD. There's no, no cup or, or hollow area around the base. If we look at the other two, pairs of prodorsal CD. Here's the other two, and they're, they are not uh, trichobothria. So there's no trichobothria. So we move on to couplet six. Movable clistral digit long with a proximal hook. Clistral bases fuse into a retractable Retractile stylophore, paratremes on anterior margin of prodorsum, pretarsus claws with tenant hairs, and these are obligate plant feeders, tetranochoidea, versus movable clistral digit short and linear, clistral bases completely separate, partially fused or fused to a non retractile stylophore capsule. The uh, paratremes are between the clistral bases or on the dorsum of the stylophore, or absent. Right, I'm gonna change specimens here for a second. All right, we're, we're back to 40X under our original specimen. 
We looked at uh, a different specimen under oil immersion to see the pretarsi. Okay, so we're on couplet six. Movable digit long with a proximal hook. Cholesterol base is fused into a retractile stylophore. Paratremes on the anterior margin of prodorsum. Pretarsal claws with ten hairs and obligate plant feeders. Versus movable cholesterol digit short, linear. Cholesterol base is completely separate, partially fused or completely fused into a non-retractile stylophore. Paratremes between the cholesterol bases on dorsal of stylophore, uh, base of the stylophore or absent. And if we look at the refresh, go back where we were. This is the prodorsum of the mite. Here's your fused stylophore. Your paratreme stigmata is here. Your paratremes come up onto the anterior part of the prodorsum. And your movable cholesterol digit is this long structure here with a basal hook. So we've determined it's tetranicoidea. Superfamily tetranicoidea consists of five families. Now we'll go on to the, the family. Couplet seven, palpatibial claw, ceta present, palpatibial claw like ceta absent. Here we have the palps again. And here's your palp femur, palp genu, and palp tarsus. The palps are not linear. We have what we call thumb claw. Here's your claw like ceta on the palp tibia. Here it is on this side, the palp tibial claw like ceta. So the palps are not linear. If they were linear, they would be very straight. They're more of a hook here. The palp tibia is, is acts almost like the terminal segment. Palp tarsus is off to the side. This is the thumb claw. And the presence of the palp tibial claw tells you you have a thumb claw structure. Palp tibia and your palp tarsus back behind here. So it palp tibial claw like see is present. We go on to couplet eight. Solanidia on tarsus leg one linear versus short and bulbous. Here is your one of your solanidia on the tarsus leg one. Now you can tell a solanidian from a normal ceta by the fact that solanidia are hollow. And frequently you can only see that at the base. If you look at the base of this, you may have to go to higher magnification. If you see the base of this, you'll see it's lighter colored in the middle. That tells you it's hollow. And that tells you this is a solanidian. It's definitely linear. It's uh, not short and bulbous. So we move on to couplet nine. Opistosomal C row with not more than four pairs of CD. As we said at the beginning, the body of prostigmatid mites are divided in two regions, your prodorsum and the opistosoma. And they're divided by the, the sejugal furrow but in many cases in prostigmata, you can't tell where the sejugal furrow is. In this case, it, it's actually relatively easy to see, to see it. Here we have your anterior most pair of, of prodorsal CD, your second, and then your third pair, your eyes. You look carefully at the striations here. You can see there's a change right here. This separates your prodorsum from your epistosoma. Now, if we're dealing with the opistosoma, row C is the first row in the opistosoma. Here we have, this is the C row. This, these two pairs are C1. You count from the middle out laterally. So we have, in this, in this, in this view, we have C1 pair, C2 pair, and if we move out to one side, and this particular specimen is sort of blown out, there's C3. So the couplet says, Pistosomo C row with no more than four pairs of CD. CD on posterior margin, not flagelliform or, or bipectinate. So we have three CD in the C row, three pairs of CD. Now we'll move to the posterior end of the mite, and we can identify it by the rows. There's the C row, D row, E row, F row, and the last ones are the H's. There's one pair of H, and there's actually two pairs of H. The other pair is more ventral. There's the other pair of H's. These are the, your PS's or anal CD. 
So there's one, two pairs of H's, and the couplet says there are uh, five or more pairs of, of CD on the posterior margin, or HCD. There are only two pairs, and they're definitely not flagelliform CD or bipectinate. So there's two pairs of H's. So we can eliminate the um, tetra D. We're going to the tetranicod. Couplet 10, we're looking at the subfamilies of the tetranicod. And we'll probably have to go back. No, we can see it on this. All right. This is leg three of the pretarsis. Here you can see claw one, claw two, it has 10 hairs. And if you look here in the center, this is where the impodium will be. And there are no 10 hairs coming off the impodium. The couplet says impodium usually present and without 10 hairs. It may also be absent. Females with one or two pairs of anal CD. Males with four pairs of anal genital CD. We're dealing with female here versus uh, Impodium always with tenant hairs and with two or three pairs of anal CD in the female. So let's see if we have a better specimen here, better, a better Tarsus 1. This one's pretty good. This is Tarsus 2, leg 2. We can see your pair of claws, one claw, one claw. And if you focus up and down, you can see the tenant hairs coming off of them. The Impodium is right here in the center. And there are no tenant hairs coming off of it. And if we go back and look at the anal region, just showed it to you a minute ago. We'll look at it again. This is the, vent the ventral view. This is the genital region. This is the anus here. These are the anal valves. And we have two pairs of CD. So there's only two pairs of anal CD, and there are no tenant hairs on the uh, impodium. So we're in the subfamily Tetranichini. We move on to couplet 11. And again, we're looking at the impodium. I have to go back to the other, other slide. All right, we've gone back to oil immersion. We're at couplet 11, impodium claw, impodium claw-like, or split distally, ending in tufts of hairs. Tarsus leg one with two pairs of duplex CD, and leg two with one pair, versus impodium absent or claw-like. Tarsus leg one with loosely associated CD, or with one pair of duplex CD. If two pairs of duplex CD, then tarsus leg one without a duplex CD. All right, so we're looking at the pretarsus. This happens to be leg three. And focusing, we can see that there's your cl one claw. It's a pad-like claw with your tenant hairs coming off of it. This structure here in the center is your impodium. And if we follow it out, we see it's split into multiple hairs. So it is present. Let's look at another leg. It's always good to look at multiple legs to look at how the pretarsi are so that in case one doesn't give you a good view, you can look at another one. So here we're looking at another leg. And here's your claw. With your tenant hairs coming off. And you can, this structure here is your impodium, and it's split distally. Can't really see the other claw very clearly because it's right underneath the impodium. It's a lateral view. You get the best view of a pretarsis when you have a lateral view. When you've got a dorsal ventral view, it doesn't show up as well. The claws show up well, but the impodium does not. So you always want to try and get a lateral view. And you may have to look at multiple legs or even multiple specimens to see that view. So we do have a Impodium, the split distally. Now we'll look at the. Um, uh, now we'll look at. Let me get back. All right, we're looking at leg one. We're just looking at a different leg. You can see the, the ten hairs coming off the two claws. 
The podium, if you look carefully here, you can see split distally into uh, multiple hair-like structures. Next part of the couplet is to look at the duplex CD. A duplex CD is where you have a solnidian, which is here, and if you look carefully, you can see it's hollow in the middle, so you know it's a solnidian, and then a very closely associated, much smaller CETA. So you've got your solnidian very long, and then very short, see to associate with the base. Now you can have one or two pairs or they can be absent. That was one. In this view we have both pairs of duplex CD in view. Here's your solnidian. Here's your associated CETA base and see the bases are, are joining. This is a duplex CETA. Your other one is here. And you can see there's the small CETA associated with it, and there's your very long solnidian. So on couplet 11, we've determined we have a split distally in podium. We have two pairs of duplex CD. And on tarsus 2, this is tarsus leg 1. Let's look at tarsus 2. This is tarsus leg 2. Here's your solnidian, and there's your associated CETA. There's only one pair. We focus up and down. We'll see there's only one pair of, this is the ventral view. The duplex CD will always be dorsal, maybe a little lateral, but you can see these other CD, they're just, they're just normal CD. So we'll move on to couplet 12. In couplet 12, we're looking at the opistosoma again, and now we're going to switch back to lower power. Okay, we're back on 40X. We're looking at the prodorsum here. Your uh, one pair, two pairs, and your third one is over here. These are the eyes. So if we move right here, you can see the change of the striations come down and they loop around like this. This is your dorsal sejugal furrow where it would be. So that makes these CD the C row. These, these, this pair would be C1. The C1 pair is always in the center of the idiosoma, of the opistosoma. So C1, D1, E1, F1, and your H's, one pair here, one pair more ventral near the, near the anus. So this couplet says, opistosoma with F1 pair in the normal position versus F1 pair marginal or absent. So let's go back up a little bit. By normal position, we mean they're aligned with the C, D, E. So let's go back. Here's your C1. There, this is the dorsal sigugal furrow. C1, D1, E1, F1. So F1 is in line basically with C1, D1, E1 which makes it in the normal position. Opposing couplet, it could be marginal, and what happens sometimes is the FC that gets moved way out here, or it could be actually missing. So F1 is in the normal position. Now we move on to the next couplet, where we have to determine how many HCD are present. The number of HCD is very important to determine the genera within the tetranicidae. It's also one of the more difficult characters to see. Again, starting, here's your dorsal sejugal furrow. See these curved striations that marks the edge of the prodorsum. So these are your C1 CD, D1, E1, F1. That makes this pair your HCD. So that'd be H1, and if we focus ventral to where you see your PSCD on the anus, this other CETA over here, there's your PSCD on the anus, this is your H2. H1, out of focus here, H2. PS, PS. In addition, ventrally on the adult female, you have an additional CD. Now you have to be careful when you're focusing that you don't mix dorsal and ventral CD. You also have two pair of genital CD. This is the genital region. 
This is the genital flap. And there's another pair of CD up here. You can see the base of one. This is your adgenital. So ventrally, there's your adgenitals, one pair, your two pairs of genitals, and then your PSCD. Other CD there are HCD. You can work at it two ways. You can work from the, starting with the adgenital CD, find your genital CD, and then your PSCD, and then what's left there are part of your H's. Although I find the easiest way to start with a C, find your C row, D row, E row, F row, and then you find your PS's, your genitals, your adgenitals, and then everything that's left there are HCDs. Your choice is two pairs or three pairs. In this case, there are two pairs. Normally, if there's three pairs, the H1 CD will be more like dorsal CD. If you notice here, these are more like ventral, they're very different from your dorsal CD. They're much shorter, smaller. So this, this is your, actually this is your H2, H3. There's only two pairs of H's. H1 is what's missing in this particular specimen. Then what you're looking at is the number of, H, number of pairs of HCD, whether there's two pairs of HCD or three pairs. In this case, we have two pairs of HCD. So that moves us on to couplet 14, and we look at the impodium again. If we can see it in this specimen, not really. When you're looking at these specimens, feel free to look at multiple specimens, multiple legs. Just backtracking a second here. Here's your duplex CD under 40X. There's one pair here, and there's the other pair right there on leg one. Still can't see the, the pretarsal claws very clearly on this specimen, so we'll have to probably go back to oil immersion. Okay, we're back to oil immersion. We're looking at pretarsus of leg one. Here's one claw with your ten hairs, and you see the other ten hairs sticking out. Here, right here in the middle is your impodium, and you can see that it splits into multiple fine hairs. So on this couplet, impodium split distally, usually three pairs of hairs, duplex CD on tarsus leg one, well separated versus uh, impodium claw either entire or with proximal ventral hairs or deeply split into two claw-like structures. Duplex CD on tarsus, distal and adjacent. So we're looking at tarsus one, so we can see that the impodium is split distally. It's not entire. It's not claw-like all the way out. It's not split into two claws. And doesn't have proximal ventral hairs. Here are your two pairs of duplex CD, one here and the other one here. And duplex CD are well separated. Eh, they're well separated. So it's a matter of, of judgment here. The other option is where they're adjacent and distal, so they both be out here is the other option. They're, they're well separated here. So we're going to couplet 15. Paratreme recurve distally. Uh, impodial spur generally visible. Uh, while we're looking at the impodium, we'll see if we can see the impodial spur. spur. We're looking for the impodial spur now. It's not always visible. It's not, a, not one of the best characters to use because it could be artifact of mounting, where you mount it so you can't see it or just not visible in that particular individual specimen. You may want to look at multiple specimens. If the impodial spur is visible, this is leg four, it'll be right in here. It'll be right, sort of right on top. Here you've got your split, your impodium split distally, your impodial spur will be right in this area. And it'll be just thicker than the other structures coming off the impodium. Let's look at the other legs just in case we can see it. Say so it's generally, it, it may or may not be visible. One of 
when it's present, it's really obvious. It's not visible on this particular specimen. Let's look at the paratremes. We're still under oil immersion. All right, we're back. This is your, your, your prodorsum. This is your anterior most prodorsal CD. And right here. Here's one of the paratremes. This is your stylophore sticking out. This is retracted also. It can be pulled back into the body. This is one paratream. It goes on down to where your stigmata be down in this area. Comes up, around, and just loops like this. This is typical of a lot of tetranicids where you have a paratream that just loops. It may be hooked. Sometimes it's bulbous at the end. Sometimes it's not hooked at all. Looking on the other side. These are paired, so they'll be, they'll be one on one side, one on the other. Here's the other paratreme coming out, making a nice hook there. In this case, we're paratreme recurved distally, hooked. Uh, in proteospur, generally visible, well, we didn't see it in this specimen, versus paratreme anestomost distally. By anestomost, it means it will, the end of it will be just a mass of, of tubule structures. This is just one simple tube, and that separates the tetranicus, genus tetranicus from amphitetranicus. Amphitetranicus is not currently known from North America. It is a pest of fruit trees in Europe, so it's one we don't want to get. But this is how you separate tetranicus from amphitetranicus. At this point, you cannot go any further in the key unless you have a male. In most cases, on interceptions, you're only going to have immatures and females. Immatures and females can be identified to genus, but you cannot go to species in most genera of the Tetranicidae without a male. In the genus Tetranicus, where we are now, you cannot identify it reliably without a male. At this point, we'll move on in the key, keying it out to species, but we'll be doing all our work under oil immersion because you cannot see the structures necessary uh, of the Ediagus without, uh, without oil immersion. The initial part of the key to the species, uh, we can do it under, low, under 40x with a female. So we'll go back to 40x. All right, we'll start here at the prodorsum. We're under 40x. Here's your anterior prodorsal CD, your second pair of prodorsal CD, your eyes. And you see one of the other, the third pair of prodorsal CD. Again, we're looking for the dorsal sejugal furrow. And you can see the striations on the prodorsum come down and loop right here. So this is your dorsal sejugal furrow, although you cannot see it clearly, which makes. Here's your dorsal sejugal furrow. This is the prodorsal striations. This is your C row. D row and so on. Now the first couplet says, opisthosomal striae varied, not all transverse. Okay, let's just move our way down C, D, E, F, H and see how the striations go. Here they're transverse. Here's a C row. They're all transverse. D row, they're still transverse. We get the E row and look, they curve. They're not transverse. F row, they're not transverse. They're varied. Some are transverse, some are not. So first couplet, they are varied. They're not entirely transverse. We go on to couplet 17. Dorsal epistosomo striae forming a diamond pattern between CD E1 and F1. That's E1. That's F1. We'll go back to make sure. C, D, E, F. And if you look carefully here, you see the striations form a diamond pattern. See how they're different from the ones around it. They form a nice diamond. The other option is it forms an hourglass. So we have a nice diamond form, a diamond pattern 
in the epistosomal striations between E1 and F1. So we're now in the Tetranicus urtici species group. You can go this far. If you have a female, you can go to the urtici species group, but it's a very, very large group, so it doesn't really tell you much about the species. All right, the next character, we have to go to oil immersion again. Now we're in oil immersion. We're looking at, still looking at the female mite. We're looking at the genital region of the female mite. And just to get you oriented, this is the genital flap. This is one pair of genital CD. And there's the other one. So there's one, two pairs of genital CD. Here's your ad genital CD. One here, one here. So this is the genital flap. And there's an area where are called pregenital striations. Here's your one pair of genital CD. Your ad genitals, there's one sticking out. So it's just above here. These are your pregenital striae. And how they appear is an important species characteristic. If you look at this particular specimen, you can see they're nice and complete on the edges. As you get towards the center, they sort of fade out. And our choice here is pregenital striations, mixture of broken and solid lines, versus pregenital striations, unbroken. And you can see they're nice and, and they're entire here. As we get to the center, they're more broken and partial. And then as we get the edge again, they're, they're entire. So this is a mixture of broken and solid lines, the pregenital striations, which is just anterior to your genital flap. The genital region of the female is always easy to see by this uh, convoluted cuticle around it. Makes it very easy to see the, where the female genital region is. So from this point on, we're only dealing with the male. Okay, this is the male Ediagus. In the females, it's easy to tell the adgenitals, the genitals, and the anal CD or PSCD very easily, and the, and the HCD. In the males, it's sort of difficult because the male opisthosoma is pointed, and all these CD tend to run together, so it's hard to tell which ones are genitals, which ones are anals, which one are HCD. And usually what they do, we do is we count the total number of CD to determine whether it, it's uh, which subfamily it's in. But we already know that we're looking with a tetranicchini, and we've already determined the genus is tetranicus. So now all we have to do is look at the Ediagus. This is the Ediagus here. Hundreds of different shapes of Ediagi. Uh, there's a different shape for each species. Although some species are very similar, you can use, that's what we use to identify species. And it's the profile, especially the tip, that's most important. All right, we're at, we're at couplet, we were at couplet 18. We determined the, in the female, the pregenital striation is a mixture of broken and unbroken lines. So now we're at couplet 20. Ediagus head directed forward. Uh, pregenital striation varied. Ediagus recur, Ediagus head recur, pregenital striations um, lobed. We determined the striations were varied. And this is the head of the Ediagus. It's not recurved, it's directed forward. So we go on to couplet 20. Pregenital striations broken medially, solid laterally. We saw that when we looked at the female. So we go on to 21. Ediagus with a short neck, head not bird-like, angular, more or less anvil-shaped, versus Ediagus long, slender neck, small bird-like head, pointed beak. In this case, it is not bird-like. Some of the EDA guy look like the heads of, of in profile look like the heads of birds with a beak and a rounded head. This is more anvil shaped. You can see it's sort of domed in the middle and pointed out at each end. Now we're going to couple at 22. EDA is slightly indented dorsally with a short pointed beak. Can't see the, the, the indentation as clearly as I'd like on the specimen. But you can see it, it's, it's got a very short anterior projection, short posterior projection. 
giving it very much an anvil shape, and there is a little depression in the middle. Uh, there is some variation, and depending on how you mount it, the angle at which you do, will make a difference in, in how the EDA gets views. Usually what we do at this point is that they're in the various publications, they're lit figures of EDA guy, and you compare it with the uh, known species and make your, confirm your identification from there. Ideally, you would like to have reference specimens to compare it with, but that's not always possible. So this is Tetranicus urtici, one of the most common uh, spider mites, commonly intercepted, common on a lot of ornamental plants. Okay, we've now identified a spider mite to species. As you can see, with a female, you can get to genus. Almost any genera within the Tetranicidae can be identified using just females and immatures. If you need to go to the adult, you must have a male in most genera. Genus Tetranicus, which we did here, you absolutely have to have a male to do a species identification. You can only go so far with the female and immatures, but to actually get a species identification that is reliable, you have to have a male. Even people who work with these mites for many years, in most cases, cannot put a species identification on most Tetranicus species without the male. 